Hello everyone and welcome to another session of computational algebraic geometry. So today uh, we will continue solving polynomials exactly, so this is a direct continuation of the previous lecture. And we discussed that we're solving polynomials abstractly and therefore the solutions come to us for free and the real problem is to uh, develop the arithmetic of our abstract roots. And what we've done before was to work with a single root and now we're going to talk about adding more than one root. So let's start with one very simple example. So if I were to take qx modulo x squared minus 1, minus 2. So I'm adding the two square roots of 2. So here we have r, that was x mod f, or x mod x squared minus 2. Maybe I refer to this as x bar. So maybe instead of writing x mod the polynomial, I can remind you that this is the image of x by writing x bar. And here what happens is that r and minus r are the two roots. In other words, when we add one of the roots, namely r, uh, the other root is simply its negative, but it, this is not what's going to happen in general. So for example, I'll take the following example. So I have qx x cubed minus 2. Again, I have r here, the image of x. Now what's going to happen here is that there is precisely one root of the polynomial x cubed minus 2 in this field. So let's call this E. And you can see that there is only room for precisely one root by embedding E into the complex field. So let's let's do this now. In order to embed E, we need to actually uh, talk about the roots. So we have the real positive cube root of 2. We have then a cube root of 1 times cube root of 2 and another cube root of 1 times cube root of 2. And what you need to notice is that these two will have imaginary part, whereas this is purely real. So now if I consider the embedding corresponding to this cube root, then the image of E must lie inside of the real field. Right, so it's Q span of this cube root of 2, and so we have to land in the real field which means that uh, no number inside of E will map into these other roots that have an imaginary component. In other words, inside of E, there exists only one root of this polynomial. As we discussed, R could have been mapped to uh, this root, for example, and we would have gotten another embedding, but the fact remains that uh, we will miss the other two roots in its image. So it's sufficient to observe this by studying one embedding. Okay, so maybe we want to be able to work with uh, all the roots of this polynomial. Uh, we want to be able to do arithmetic here. And then I want to add the extra roots into E. So how do I go about it? Okay, so first of all, I take my polynomial y cubed minus 2. So the variable x, I, the name I used up. So I am creating a new name y, and I'm viewing my coefficients in E. So now pre previously, x cubed minus 2 which was viewed as an element of the polynomial ring with rational coefficients, was irreducible. This will not be irreducible because I already have a root here, and I can basically figure out how it decomposes by doing polynomial division. So remember, r is the image of x in E, so that stands for a root of cube root of 2. Okay, so let's do polynomial division. Uh, so I will leave some space here for squares and linear forms, and then write the constants. Okay, so the first step is easy. I just uh, divide y cubed by y. This is y squared. And I get minus r, sorry, this is y cubed. And then minus r times y squared goes here. And I subtract. So this gives me r y squared. I leave some space here. And then minus 2 comes down. Okay, now r y squared divided by is plus r y. So that gives me r y squared minus r r squared y. So the difference is r squared y plus 2. Now finally, I divide r squared y by y to get r squared, and this is r squared y minus r cubed. Sorry, I made a typo here, so this minus 2 comes down without a sign change. And here, the difference is 0, because of course r cubed was 2 inside of the field E. And this allows us to factor y cubed minus 2. Let's maybe write this down. 
So inside of this EY, I was able to factor my polynomial and the other roots uh, of the other cube roots of two have to satisfy this quadratic polynomial. And we've seen that this quadratic polynomial cannot split EY in EY because otherwise we would have found them in E. So they do not live in E, therefore this thing does not decompose into linear factors. Okay, so let's declare this to be G, polynomial GY. And next thing is to extend E by this polynomial. Right, so let E prime be E of Y modulo G of Y. And we know this corresponds to adding a root of this quadric into the field E. And what happens is that now that I have a quadric, if I have one root, it will split into two linear factors in E prime. If it splits into two linear factors, that means I also have the second root inside of E, which means this field will contain all three roots. So maybe let's try to understand what is the third root in terms of the other two roots because two roots generate e prime, therefore the third root must be an expression in terms of those first two. So observe that, that I could have written e prime as the quotient of the polynomial ring over q in two variables, where I mod out by x square x cube minus two and gy, but gy doesn't make sense here, so I should replace r with x. That becomes y squared plus xy plus x squared. So since I'm modding out by x cubed minus 2, x is automatically a cube root of 2, hence what I called r here. So this is a lifting of gy into this polynomial ring. So any lift would have worked. Maybe I say this is isomorphic. And r1, let's say is the image of x1, is a root of x cubed minus 2. r2, which will be the image of y, is another root. And then what is R3 instead of these two generators? Well, we can answer this question by polynomial division again. So in E prime, let's do our polynomial division. So now again, to be uh, very pedantic, we can talk about the polynomial GZ in E prime of Z. So here GZ is just our polynomial, this polynomial in E prime. So that was so it used to be gy, but I would like to change my y to be a variable. I don't want to make keep it as a number in E prime. So now I've added the root of this polynomial, so this should split. And so maybe I denote this now by r1, just to keep this notation here. And I'm dividing by the other root r2. Okay, so I just multiply this by z. And now I divide this linear term. Okay, so in principle, I don't have to uh, compute what's happening here. I know z minus r2 has to divide this expression. Therefore, this thing has to be zero. But now it's a good exercise to check that these two expressions cancel out. Well, it's kind of very easy, but And this is just this polynomial, obviously. Now, as a result of this, we've seen that gz breaks into z minus r2 and z plus r1 plus r2. Or we can say that the third root has to be minus r1 minus r2. Now, the conclusion is that we were free to choose the first root. So it could have been any of the three complex roots when we were embedding e. Uh, we will see this later, and but it's kind of clear here that the second root we're also free to choose out of any of the remaining two roots, and but then the third root, of course, is completely determined. So there's only one root left, and in this case, uh, the value of the third root is described by this expression. I mean, what's very nice here is that I can do uh, arithmetic rigorously involving these three roots purely in this polynomial ring. I mean, so in this quotient of the polynomial ring, and this polynomial ring only has rational coefficients, and therefore algebra here is uh, extremely easy. Everything is explicit. I don't need to deal with approximations. Now, uh, there were two complications that sort of dissolved on their own. One of them was uh, that something was very simple when I was trying to add a second root. And the other thing was uh, I added two roots coming from the same polynomial. 
So what if I want to work with two roots coming from different polynomials? So this is uh, both of these issues sort of can be resolved together and that's what we're going to do now. Okay, now uh, we begin the development for working with two algebraic numbers, so two roots of polynomials. And of course, it will be clear uh, then inductively we will be able to work with an arbitrary number of algebraic numbers. So the setup is this. So I take two polynomials for simplicity with rational coefficients. So these I want to take irreducible and I have in mind two roots, two complex roots coming from f and g. And what I want to do is to understand the field generated by alpha and beta purely algebraically using f and g. So the field generated by alpha and beta, so that's the smallest subfield of the complex field containing alpha and beta. So that we want to be able to do arithmetic in this field, but without having to worry about approximating alpha and beta and using f and g just like before. So I should note that uh, previously we didn't care about which of the roots of f we were working with. In this case, uh, this, there's some chance that it will uh, play a role. And uh, in any case, it's, it's now important that I have in mind some choice of a root of f and some root of choice of uh, g. And one way to do it is to choose a number close enough to both alpha and beta. I mean, as long as I have a concrete way of specifi specifying it, but it's actually better to be approximate arbitrarily well, both alpha and beta, so that my, maybe I need a number in a convergence basin or something. So another note is that uh, what we're going to do next will be able to handle perfectly well if f equals g. And so this was the construction we have done uh, upstairs when we were studying the cube roots of two. And now here's the construction. So if I take e, the field generated by x modulo f, and now I take g, but I uh, view its coefficients as living in this field. So obviously rationals inject here, so that's fine. So I will write it as g e and Maybe I write G-E-Y, so this is the, the this is the polynomial uh, G with coefficients used as element in E and variable Y. And now here comes uh, something non-trivial. We're going to factor G. So G used to be irreducible here in this polynomial ring. It uh, does not have to be irreducible here. Uh, so I need to factor it into irreducibles in this polynomial ring. So let's let's write Let's write g1 through gk for the irreducible factors. And I have to say that I need to leave this as a black box now. Uh, it turns out that factoring polynomials, or even in sort of number fields or abstract number fields, is uh, perfectly doable. Uh, the point is that you can do um, reduction modulo a prime, and uh, modulo a prime, there are finitely many irreducibles. So it's kind of easy to find the irreducible factors. And it turns out you can lift those irreducible factors back up to Q uh, if your prime is large enough. You don't even have to work. So this is a sort of a subject on its own, so I won't go there, but I mean, uh, this is a key in computational algebraic geometry. Okay, so we leave this as a black box now and continue. And at least one thing is true that if your G is irreducible already, then G E is irreducible, then uh, of course this is an easier problem. And now the problem becomes the following. I had to extend E by one of these irreducible polynomials. I think it is clear, but it's not clear which one I should work with. So I have the extensions. Right, so this will be a finite field extension of E, but I, I don't know which one I'm supposed to take if I would like to understand the field generated by alpha and beta. And this is exactly where the approximations come from. And the, the question is, which one is isomorphic to, and uh, the, the way we're going to answer this question is to find which of these polynomials annihilate beta, and this only makes sense if you first embed E using the root corresponding to alpha. So let's do that. So consider the embedding. So this maps the root, or x bar, let's say, to alpha, and these will, this embedding will in turn map all of my gi's into some polynomials uh, with coefficients involving alpha.
So each of the polynomials gi, they used to have coefficients in e. After I add embed e into c, uh, e hits the field generated by alpha. And so I construct the polynomial where I apply this embedding into the coefficients of gi. So I get a polynomial with variable y and coefficients in this field. And now I would like to evaluate all of these polynomials at beta. Now, only one of these polynomials can be zero. So I leave this as an exercise that only one of these uh, can be zero. And here's the hint. You have to show that x minus beta divides the g of x exactly once. And in order to show this, uh, you can study the greatest common divisor of g and g prime and use irreducibility of g. But okay, so if only one of them is zero, uh, then if I am only able to approximate alpha and beta, I can actually figure that out. So if my approximation is sharp enough, I will be able to tell that most of these are sort of away from zero in a way that's sort of further away than my precision, uh, whereas one of them looks to be as zero as my precision would allow it. Uh, so here, uh, of course, there are many tricks available to you, but already in the previous lecture, we've discussed that uh, when trying to decide if an algebraic number is zero, uh, I can figure out an explicit bound where if this number is smaller than that explicit bound, if the norm is smaller than the bound, it has to be equal to zero. So this was this involved the height of the polynomials, in this case of f and g. So there, in fact, this can be approximated rigorously to this precision. Uh, precisely one of these numbers will have norms smaller than my bound uh, to, if my precision is high enough. And that's it. This, is, this gives me the i for which this polynomial vanishes. Okay, so let's say uh, g1 is the one that annihilates beta. So up to re-indexing this, I can say, of course. Uh, so I want to take e1. So I want to say that e1 is isomorphic to the field generated by alpha and beta. I think now this is uh, more or less clear, but uh, let's study this field a little bit more. So first of all, I can say that E1 is isomorphic to the field QXY, so the polynomial ring XY, modulo, first of all, I have the polynomial in X, and then I can write down a polynomial in X and Y, uh, where this G1 of XY uh, lifts this, what I wrote as G1 of Y inside EY. So there's an obvious surjective map here, where x goes to the generator in E, and so I take any of the lifts. So we've done this before, and maybe let's go all the way up to our, this, where we had, we were studying the cube roots of two. So remember here, when we were studying the cube root of two, uh, this was the lift I've taken. So x was r in this uh, field E, and but I just lifted r to x. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. So that establishes E1, as a very simple object where I'm working with polynomials with rational coefficients. So the arithmetic here will be uh, super easy. And essentially by design, I have this map now. So where the image of x in E1 and the image of y in E1, uh, they go to alpha and beta respectively. The only thing I need to show uh, is first uh, this map obviously lists to q, x, y to c, and I need to show that f annihilates alpha, that's by definition, alpha was the root of f, and alpha beta annihilates g1. And that's how we have chosen g1 anyway, so that's going to work. And that's independent of the lift you've chosen here. And uh, I leave it as an exercise to fill out all the details. So anything that makes you uncomfortable, now uh, you should prove that such a thing exists. If you're not comfortable, why this is an injection, maybe prove this. You can, for example, use the tower of embeddings. So this, if you know about uh, rings a little bit more, I mentioned before that a morphism of fields uh, is has to be an injection. But you could also argue like this, that I have Q goes to C, uh, the obvious map. I have E goes to C via I alpha. And now I have E1, and I'm saying that there's a map i alpha beta. So we've established this map before, and by the same argument, this is just a simple extension. So I just need to show that the extension, the abstract extension of 
e1 over e can be emitted into c via beta. So we can use the previous argument from the previous lecture. Okay, so first uh, let's get these couple of ideas out of the way. One of them is that my e1 over q has a degree that's equal to e1 over e times e over q. So of course this is the degree of g1 times the degree of f. So in particular this is a finite extension over q and I know the extension degree. And uh, we can repeat this kind of extension again and again so that I have a tower of uh, height 2 if you want, but I could have constructed a tower of arbitrarily large height. So I could repeat So if I want to study uh, the field generated by, let's say, L algebraic numbers, uh, and I wanted to give an, sort of an exact arithmetic representation of this field, just like this one over here, then what I could do is to simply continue. So I've studied uh, this two-number exten two, two extension, but the third one would just be the same. So now I'd have to factor the third, the minimal polynomial for the third number over E1, and then continue on from there. So here I should also note that Magma has built-in capabilities to deal with towers of extensions. So there's a section on the documentation about constructing number fields. It tells you how to construct these things. So one final remark here is maybe it's unpleasant to have this multivariate representation of a field, so to have a tower of uh, extensions. I mean, here already we have a two-variable polynomial ring, and the algebra of two-variable polynomial rings is significantly more complicated than the algebra of a one-polynomial, one-variable polynomial ring. Therefore, I might want to represent this as a quotient of a univariate polynomial ring. And it turns out that this is always possible. So the question was, can I have my field, which involved two variables, and represent it as a quotient of a single variable polynomial ring by some other polynomial h? So the answer is yes, and the way you do it is uh, moderately easy. So, I mean, there are also complicated ways to do it, but here's a very simple argument. So you have to use the following theorem. So this theorem is called the primitive element theorem. So it says the following, uh, given any finite field extension, say e over f uh, with characteristic of the base field being zero so for example if this is q uh, the rational field then this is fine then there will exist a number or an element in e such that e is isomorphic to f adjoint alpha so here i'm writing it in square brackets because this will be the set So this will be the set of polynomials of degree uh, d minus 1 in alpha, where, of course, d is the extension degree of e over f. So in fact, uh, this is this I could say to be equality. So f of alpha lives already in e, so this is an equality. But uh, we can be much more explicit about the choice of alpha. So the answer is that not only is this isomorphic to a single variable thing, so that basically converts our e1 uh, into something that can be generated by a single variable in, inside of here. But uh, we can be explicit about how to choose a generator. And the statement goes like this. So what happens is that there are finitely many f vector spaces inside of e. So these are proper vector spaces, so they're not equal to e, uh, such that if you choose any alpha and e that's outside of these vector spaces, you're good this identity will hold. Perhaps uh, expressed a little bit more pedestrian way, we can say that if you were to pick a random alpha in E, then you expect uh, this identity to hold. Now, how do you use this theorem? What you need to do is take in sort of a random element. And how do you do this? Well, this is a finite dimensional vector space over Q, and it's generated by certain powers of X and y and products of those powers. And I just need to take arbitrary coefficients for those powers. And so I generate sort of like a random univariate polynomial with degrees bounded by the obvious constraints here coming from f and g. 
And now once I have this element, I need to cook up its minimal polynomial. And then I will have an isomorphism to this uh, field where z goes to this random element I generated and h will be its minimal polynomial. And how do I find its minimal polynomial? Well, uh, we have done this in the previous lecture when we were trying to show that uh, these, uh, these quotients are fields. Let's go back to this. So remember, uh, yet in the previous lecture when we were trying to show that elements in such a quotient are invertible, what we did was at some point we had to pick an element, non-zero element, and then consider its powers. So its powers has to become linearly dependent, and then we just find the first linear dependence, and this will give us a polynomial. And if this is of the smallest order, then this will be the minimal polynomial of the element. And this is pure linear algebra, and in applying it to our problem, this will be linear algebra over the rational field. Okay, so for my random element, I just have to take these powers, and since I'm living in a finite dimensional Q vector space, uh, I can find this uh, linear dependence. Okay, so this is how you can uh, use this. Uh, obviously, Magma also has an implementation. You can ask for the absolute field uh, of a number field that's given as a tower. And you can also ask for a primitive element. Yeah, so Magma will do these things for free, and uh, Sage should also. Now, I, don't, I won't give a proof of this, but I will give an idea. So the, the reason I'm not giving a proof is that it requires Galois theory. Uh, so Galois theory says that So Galois theory says that there are only finite to many intermediate fields between F and E, which means that if you choose any element alpha that does not lie inside of these intermediate fields, then the field generated by alpha will equal E. And of course, these I've chosen notation so that these are precisely the vector spaces that I was talking about. Obviously, any intermediate field will be an F vector space. And uh, the field generated by alpha will have this polynomial expression. Again, this is nothing new. We've, we've shown that somehow these number field extensions uh, become invertible, even if you're just working with these polynomial expressions. So I already showed you the proof in just a few minutes ago from uh, last week, uh, sorry, the last lecture. And there we remember we constructed that inverses of elements are all, always have this polynomial expression. Okay, so that concludes the sketch of proof. And now uh, you're ready to do exact arithmetic with an arbitrary number of uh, algebraic numbers. So the only flimsy part of this construction is uh, to find a factorization of your intermediate polynomials. So this uh, I'll have to give as a black box, it would take us too far afield. But anyway, Wikipedia has a good page about it and it's a classical subject. And then at some point we have to decide which factor to use. And that's where we have to deal with an approximation of alpha and beta. You have to be able to approximate numbers. Unless, of course, if you have a tower where each polynomial becomes irreducible at each stage, then you never have to approximate anything because you don't have to make a choice. So in fact, uh, this is the case where Magma has a built-in implementation to construct as large a tower of uh, extensions as possible. And uh, I mean, it, this essentially solves the problem of finding roots uh, in a very roundabout way. So in some sense, we avoid solving polynomials. Instead, we uh, work with the polynomials themselves uh, and nevertheless, we construct the arithmetic of the roots. Yes. Okay. And this concludes our discussion for today. Uh, see you in the next lecture.